um, I'm speaking on MR imaging of the hip, basically, um, uh, less of uh, pelvis bone. And in the uh, half hour that I have, I'm going to discuss a vascular necrosis of the femoral head, transient bone marrow edema, and insufficiency and stress fractures of the femoral head and vicinity of the hip joint and those few other entities that may mimic changes of these other entities and become important in the differential diagnosis. As far as technique is concerned, I'm not going to go into detail. I would just like to make a point that unless we are dealing with internal derangement of the hip joint, that my personal preference is to image the entire pelvis, particularly if we are looking for fractures. In a vascular necrosis also, we would like to see if there is involvement of the other possibly asymptomatic femoral head. So I would like to uh, include the entire pelvis and then, of course, the routine imaging is done and optional is uh, performing a sagittal uh, and coronal high resolution images of the particular site that is symptomatic. For the hip joint, Dr. Um, Rosenberg is going to discuss in more detail for internal derangement. We uh, keep the field of view limited to the uh, symptomatic site and obtain the various sequences I'm sure you're all familiar with. And uh, of course, autogram is now preferred for evaluation of the labrum and chondral injuries. Start with a vascular necrosis of the femoral head very briefly. I'm sure you're all familiar with there are uh, numerous predisposing factors, including collagen vascular diseases. Uh, treatment with steroid uh, long term or even short term has been reported in the literature. Uh, sickle cell, alcoholism, trauma, fractures of the femoral neck. That's one of the complications of subcapital femoral neck fractures, storage diseases, and otherwise. The idiopathic form of a vascular necrosis that mostly in the older literature was uh, included, we know nowadays that is probably a complication of fractures, uh, occult fractures of the femoral head and neck um, in the elderly osteoporotic individuals. I like this diagram from the, the literature that uh, shows the process of a vascular necrosis um, in phase one, basically, the femoral head, uh, there is an area where the insult takes place uh, in the superior aspect of the femoral head and is often, very characteristically, has a serpentine zone with the normal bone. It takes, for infarction, between six hours to five days to take place for various elements of bone and bone marrow and it is the fat cells usually that die last. In the second phase, there is development of hyperemia, which would take several weeks at the interface of the dead and normal bone. And then in this zone, a fibroblastic reactive zone forms. This interface goes on in phase four to extend into the necrotic bone and tries to remove the dead bone. However, this doesn't completely remove the dead bone, it's often incomplete and results in weakening of the subchondral bone. And the next phase is fracture and separation of the dead trabecular bone from the cortical bone and formation of the subchondral lucency that we are all familiar with as the crescent sign. On radiographic classification, basically, we follow this uh, process of avascular necrosis, and we do see from normal radiographic uh, study in the first stage to cystic and sclerotic changes and the subchondral lucency or the crescent sign, which basically is an indication of advanced stage of avascular necrosis. It's followed by collapse of the articular surface and secondary osteoarthritis, which develops 
in late stage. This is an advanced stage of avascular necrosis. This is a serpentinous sclerotic line and the subchondral lucency, subchondral plate crescent zone in the frontal and is usually seen better on the fraglateral projection. Now going back to MR imaging, Mitchell, Mitchell described the uh, four types or four classes of MR signal abnormalities in the femoral head of avascular necrosis. And these do not follow the process of, or, of the vascular necrosis the same way that the radiographic classification does. The class A lesions are the ones that have signal intensity consistent with fat. The second class, B, are the ones that show blood. The third or C shows signal intensity of blood on T1 and T2. And class D shows signal changes consistent with fibrous tissue. However, when these are correlated with radiographic findings, there is a relationship. The class A lesions are the majority of them compatible with the low grade or uncomplicated forms of avascular necrosis, the ones that do not show any collapse. And then the higher classes, B, C, and D, become more compatible with the complicated forms of avascular necrosis and those that have compression or depression of the femoral head. And of course, we may see on MR imaging the fat signal alone, but often a combination of these signal changes is seen. This is a classic example of a class A lesion, both on T1 that I'm showing here and on T2-weighted images. The serpentine low signal line defines this uh, dif between the necrotic and normal bone, and uh, both are fat signal. This is of uh, historic uh, value or uh, interest, uh, the double line sign that we are all familiar with as a specific sign of avascular necrosis that was uh, originally described on T1 weighted of the low signal and on T2 weighted of a low signal and inside with a rim of high signal intensity happened to generate quite a bit of interest and on subsequent histologic studies where they were not able to define these two separate zones until we were able to do fat suppressed imaging and, and on fat suppressed images this double line sign does not materialize. So the conclusion or the uh, majority of people who were studying these believe that the double line sign was nothing more than a shift artifact that is not seen with um, uh, fat suppressed imaging. This specimen is from the uh, previous MR image that I showed you. The patient elected to have a total hip replacement and you notice that the cartilage is pretty pristine but we get the chance to see the zone of infarction, the interface between the dead and uh, normal bone and here we have uh, 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 empty no cell and here we have the good bone and here we do see a position of bone on the trabecular um, consistent uh, compatible with that sclerotic zone of um, um, sclerotic zone between the dead and um, uh, n normal bone. The crescent sign, I have this beautiful uh, example from shoulder from the humeral head, but it's the same thing that we may, be, uh, we may see in the femoral head, the cortical bone, and there is the high signal and T2-weighted image which indicates separation of the subchondral bone, trabecular bone from the cortical bone, and here is the gradient echo image in the axial plane. In advanced stages, however, we do get impaction of the dead zone and we get a mixture of signal abnormalities uh, with edema. Um, blood is seen very infrequently. Fibrosis may be seen more often. Now, uh, estimation of the area of uh, necrosis has a significance in the early stage if the patient is detected. 
has a correlation, positive correlation with the uh, prognosis of the disorder. This is Beltran and uh, uh, colleagues demonstrated if you measure the, the larger the necrotic area, the greater the chance that the necrosis would proceed to the higher stages and would go on to uh, collapse and development of a vascular necrosis. Of course, this axial image also demonstrates that the necrotic area is characteristically in the anterior and the superior aspect of the femoral head. Moving on to transient migratory osteoporosis of the femoral head, this entity was first described in pregnant women and then was discovered in middle-aged or young men. Hip joint is most often involved, but the other larger joints like knee can also be involved. Uh, the main symptom is pain that could be very severe, but the disorder is limited and within three to six months usually it recovers. Complications such as fractures are uncommon but do happen because the bone becomes osteoporotic. Here is an example of a patient who presents with pain. The radiographic uh, study is unremarkable in the earliest stage, but we do see with bone scan abnormal uptake in the femoral head. This MR imaging, this is a very early uh, uh, case that I have, shows T1 in the axial plane, low signal, bright signal of edema in the, the uh, T2-weighted image with a uh, small amount of joint effusion. The same finding of low and high signal indicating edema was then recognized by some investigators in reflex sympathetic dystrophy, early AVN in trauma, and uh, even described in neoplasia. And Wilson and colleagues uh, coined the term transient bone marrow edema of the femoral head to encompass all these uh, various entities. Here is an example. In this one, the radiographic study was done several weeks down the line, and we do observe periarticular osteoporosis. The T1 way that shows low signal, you appreciate that the signal changes may not be so dramatic. On the uh, PDO T2 weighted fat suppress, we do see the bone marrow edema that extends into the femoral neck. This example is a, um, an individual who had started having hip pain when she was in the last trimester of her pregnancy. Then after she gave birth, the left hip became symptomatic, bilateral, and we followed this lady until she had complete resolution of the bone marrow edema bilaterally. Vandenberg and colleagues then studied these individuals with so-called bone marrow edema of the femoral head as the resolution of imaging was getting better and better. And he described and observed that if you look carefully in high resolution images, you may see that the bone marrow edema may not be totally um, homogeneous and that in fact there might be inhomogeneous areas of signal abnormality. He observed the presence of a low signal zone in the subcortical bone, which does not enhance with contrast in some of these uh, cases. He did follow these uh, individuals and noted that if this zone of sclerosis was more than six millimeters, that progression to AVN developed in some patients. So it's a point uh, that might be of clinical uh, help for us that to look for inhomogeneity and look for subcortical low signal zones. And if they are thicker than what you like, or six millimeters according to Vandenberg, that the possibility of a vascular necrosis should be considered. Now, we observed some time ago also this pattern of heterogeneous bone marrow edema with some reticular pattern, which if you put in any other bone would be considered trabecular fracture or bone contusion. We did observe this in several individuals who had no underlying uh, predisposing factor for avascular necrosis, and we followed them to complete resolution. Because the pattern was so much like trabecular fracture, 
we did describe insufficiency fracture of the femoral head um, and that this concept took off the uh, pathology department at uh, the hospital for special surgery went on to uh, evaluate a large number of femoral heads that they had over the years uh, with the diagnosis of avascular necrosis of the femoral head and they had total hip replacement and they reevaluated the specimens and discovered that in some of these, not in all of them, they could see insufficiency trabecular fractures with reactive changes. So that the concept is that avascular necrosis may develop following insufficiency fracture as a result of osteopenia. This is such a case that uh, we uh, had at Hospital for Special, uh, at the uh, Hospital for Joint Diseases. Unfortunately, there is no MR, but the CT does show the zone of subarticular sclerosis. Again, this patient was quite symptomatic and elected to have surgery. And you see on the specimen, areas of cortical bone that are abnormal with areas of new bone, as I'm told by the pathologist, and this image shows basically a fracture through a trabecular bone with new bone formation callus basically around it. Now this particular case however shows a little more advanced of injury to the femoral head and not to the femoral neck. Patient falls from the bed, minor injury, has pain. We look at the uh, x-ray is just increased density on the femoral head and acetabular dome, a little bit of deformity also. There is also soft tissue swelling. The MR imaging is interesting because it shows not only this linear fracture lines of the femoral head, it also shows what we are familiar with and that is insufficiency fractures of the acetabular dome. So again, if insufficiency fracture can develop in the acetabular dome, it definitely can develop in the femoral head as well. And that we got to keep in mind if the articular surface is not impacted, therefore there is a chance for these patients to improve and actually go back to normal, like any other bone contusions in other uh, bones around surrounding joints. This patient, however, had honest goodness fracture, went on to having the hip replaced and we had the chance of looking at the specimen showing the fracture at the superior aspect of the head. Again, the concept of the fracture of the femoral head in osteoporotic patients basically has taken a life of its own and, and some people believe that the rapidly destructive hip disease uh, might be the consequence of femoral head insufficiency fracture. This disorder is seen mostly in the elderly patient, the same patient population that we see insufficiency fracture of the femoral head and rapid destruction of the head does happen within several months or a year. And of course, there is a differential diagnosis to it. But here is an example of this patient had this head uh, completely uh, gone uh, within six uh, uh, months period of time. So this could be a consequence of insufficiency fracture. Now we're going to move on to occult pelvic fractures that may happen in the vicinity of the hip joint and they mimic clinically as a hip problem. Patients are again the same patient population, elderly patients and osteoporotic. They have minor or no history of trauma, and they have pain and difficulty in ambulation. MRI now, we all accept, is the modality of choice. We all have had the experience of dealing with this very difficult uh, radiographic examinations in the emergency room and question of subcapital femoral uh, neck fracture, but even a T1 weighted lousy sequence like this one can definitively uh, make the diagnosis of such fractures in a very short period of time. Now, 
The mimicker, however, we have to be aware of, and that is one of the reasons why I believe that the entire pelvis should be included in the field of imaging is that the same patient population, instead of a femoral head and neck, may develop insufficiency fractures of the pubic rami, and the fractures may not necessarily be in the superior ramus adjacent to the hip, but may even be in the pubic bone itself, so we need a larger field of view. And here is the example, high signal intensity on T2-weighted fat suppressed, and here is the stir sequence showing the uh, edema surrounding the inferior pubic ramus fracture. Of course, if displaced, we also have to look for sacral fractures. Great majority of the time, these pubic rami fractures, if displaced, are associated, if displaced 100 time, uh, percent of time, are associated with um, an opposite side of the pelvic fracture, usually sacrum. Now, fatigue fractures that happen in the normal bones, uh, usually in uh, perhaps younger uh, patients uh, are seen in the femoral neck followed by proximal shaft and pubic rami. On the other hand, insufficiency stress fractures are seen predominantly in the subcapital femoral neck, acetabular dome, pubic rami, and sacrum. Characteristic appearance radiographic of the insufficiency of, sorry, stress fracture of the medial femoral neck, the lucent zone in the cortex surrounded by reactive sclerosis, and here is the MR imaging, extensive bone marrow edema surrounding a low signal perpendicular line, which is a spongy bone callus, and that this signal, a low signal line, of course, may not be seen well on the T1-weighted image, but is very characteristic on the T2-weighted or the fat-suppressed images. The stress injury, however, may not be as advanced as having produced a fracture line. It might be in the earlier stage of in, uh, stress injury. In these cases, we basically see only a bone marrow edema in the subcortical bone, and of course, nowadays we have even the earlier of that, we may have just a periosteal uh, edema, uh, so that we don't have to have the linear low signal line to call it a stress fracture. We can call this stress injury, and this patient is quite symptomatic but in the earlier stage of stress uh, fracture. So basically, the differential diagnosis of femoral head and neck bone marrow edema would include transient osteoporosis, ADN, osteomyelitis, occasionally uh, neoplasms. But the one entity that I'm interested in discussing now is osteoarthritis of the hip because we do image these patients quite frequently, and the signal abnormality in the femoral head may mimic transient osteoporosis or AVN, and we should be able to differentiate these two. This patient had uh, started uh, with hip pain. In, in, she is in her um, early 60s and um, hip pain and a rapid narrowing of the joint. This is a progressive, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis, um, and that on MR imaging, you appreciate that there is low signal on the femoral, within the femoral head and neck, and maybe a little bit within the acetabulum as well. Appreciate that it is more expensive, the femoral head and neck, but a little bit on the acetabulum. The fact that there is any finding on the acetabular side of the joint should be the red flag that this is an arthritic process and not um, transient bone marrow edema of um, the other types. Here is another patient, it was a younger patient who had rapidly narrowing uh, joint space and extensive uh, uh, discomfort, a lot of pain. And uh, I personally had aspirated this joint for bacteria because of the, her age uh, that was uh, relatively young, 
very young, 36-year-old, no bacteria developed, extensive edema on both sides of the joint. Again, we are dealing with an arthritic process, whether this was a seronegative or the rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. Um, we should not confuse it with AVN or um, transient bone marrow edema. Also, osteoarthritis has the uh, uh, ability to develop into these uh, triangular areas of cystic change in the femoral head, which may mimic a vascular necrosis, as in this case. What is the hint? We have other findings of osteoarthritis, and of course, we have abnormality on the femoral head. You may want to say, well, the advanced stage of, of a vascular necrosis would develop into osteoarthritis. How do we make that differentiation? In my mind, if we have the combination, <coughs> excuse me, abnormality, we've got to look at the extent of the disease. Is the femoral head markedly collapsed? Then you'd think about a vascular necrosis. But in this case, that the femoral head contour is relatively maintained with this degree of osteoarthritis, we should think about osteoarthritis as the primary abnormality in this patient. Notice that the round contour of the femoral head is maintained, and these are uh, predominantly geodes of osteoarthritis, not a vascular necrosis. In conclusion, <clears throat> We have described uh, distinct patterns of signal abnormality of the femoral head in AVN, in transient osteoporosis, and insufficiency fractures of the femoral head. However, there is overlap of these various uh, signal abnormality patterns, and that we've got to be aware of also other entities, including osteomyelitis, neoplasia, and specifically osteoarthritis. Uh, and these should be considered in the differential diagnosis. And thank you very much.